welcome to the fifth episode of uh, Reinventing School. My name is Howard Blumenthal. Again, we're uh, greeting a number of guests today, both professionals and also students. And before we begin with an episode about curiosity and individual learning, um, we have to acknowledge that this has been a very difficult week, not only in the United States, but in many parts of the world. There's a lot of things happening um, that are very challenging to understand. And for me, because I'm sort of naturally inclined towards, so why are we doing, what is happening and why is it happening? And is there a historical precedent for this? Is this part of something larger? Um, is this the beginning of a much larger change? Is it tied to other things? So that's where my curiosity goes. And for the life of me, I can't figure out why we continuously take to the streets, get very angry, do all of this news media coverage around these very important issues, and then we're distracted um, and we worry about something else. So as a result, whether it's Parkland um, school shootings or whatever, we take some small actions, but after that, we just continue life as is with some minor changes. And that's deeply concerning, but I also think it's, it's very much tied to how we learn to think and what it is that we talk about in school and how our whole scheme of, of, of viewing life is put together. Uh, so in my curiosity, I wanted to understand at what point did these problems begin? And of course you can go very far back. I chose to go back to the 16, 1700s um, when uh, Britain was trying to figure out how to maintain a hold on its wool industry, which then led to interactions in India early on with its cotton industries, which were then more or less, India was then more or less replaced as a supplier uh, with Southern cotton. It was less expensive to make in the United States because all the labor was slave labor and off we go. So am I connecting the dots the right way? I don't know. And it drives me crazy that I don't know. Um, I've read books um, this morning. I, I did some more research to try to understand that. So my curiosity takes me there. How do we stop a cycle? And is it something that we ever will do? I'd like to believe that it is, and I'd like to believe the time is now. So with that, um, you know, all of our hearts go out to the difficulties um, and, and the people who have been directly affected and, uh, and a great deal of pride for people who have stood up and said things need to change. Let's hope that that continues. So with that, let me introduce some of the folks who are with us. Um, and uh, it, it, first up, I'm gonna hold up a book here because this was an influential book for me to understand this. And we'll see whether, there we go. Uh, the author's name is Susan Engel. Um, and Susan, rather than my doing a lengthy introduction, can you explain where you are and, and what you do? Let's just do it. Sure, sure. First, thanks for that opening. Obviously, we could have a whole other long conversation about the things you said to begin this session, but um, I appreciate your acknowledgement of what's going on. Uh, so I teach at Williams College. I'm a developmental psychologist, but I also direct the program in teaching. And uh, it was at Williams, actually, that my fascination with studying the development of thinking sort of converged with my interest in helping young people become teachers, like you, Ella. Um, and uh, the book that you just held up represents uh, over a decade of research on children's curiosity. And as I mentioned, I'm, I'm work you asked earlier before the show started if I was still interested in this totally, completely. I have a new book coming out in a few months that uh, sort of picks up where that book left off. So, Terrific, thank you. Now, mm -hmm. um, Young Zhao is with us as well. And uh, assuming that I didn't mangle the pronunciation uh, of, of a name that I should be able to do better, um, it, tell us about yourself, because I'm learning about you and I watched some and read some uh, things in preparation for the school. It's like, wow, I really should have known about you 15 years ago mm -hmm. and been following you. So I have a lot of catching up to do. So please, again, tell us about yourself. And if there is significance about what is in the background, tell us that as well. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Howard. I think it's great to be uh, on this show. Uh, I, I want to concur with Susan, first of all, for acknowledging you know, where we are. I think right now we are, the humanity is in a very strange moment. I think I'm uh, very aware of, we have uh, some younger people here. I think uh, you're, what you're seeing, what you're witnessing, 
won't last very long, you know, maybe 20 years, but uh, you know, that, that, that kind of situation has happened before. And so uh, myself, I, I'm now a, a professor at uh, the University of Kansas. Uh, I also hold a position at uh, University of Melbourne. So I have two jobs technically. Uh, but really, for me, it took a long way. I was born, raised in China, and uh, I came here in the 1990s in the, in the US. So I've been doing a lot of uh, education research work in various countries, but mainly really focusing on why don't we create a better space to support children to grow into themselves. Very good. Thank you. Julian is going to stay with us until 4.20 uh, or 20 minutes into the show. And the reason for that is because he has another online learning uh, situation coming up. So uh, tell us briefly about that. Tell us where you are just in the world. And most important, what are you curious about? Um, well, first of all, right now I'm in my home, if that wasn't too obvious because we're all at home be, uh, doing social distancing, quarantine. Um, it's been pretty fun. And that's, that's okay. basically it as of right now. And you're in the Philadelphia area, yes? Yes, correct. Okay, good, thank you. And so if I were to just sort of say, all right, so what are you curious about right now today at eight minutes after the hour on this particular day at this particular moment? Well, I'm first of all curious about how this all started. How did we get here? Hmm. Um, what moments led up to this big event that now we're stuck at home? That's one of my major questions that I always think about. Good, thank you. Uh, Ella, you'll be with us for the whole hour. What are you curious about? I'll start there and then we'll find out a little more about you. Um, I'm curious about um, how the COVID-19 situation will play out and how everything will be changed and if there will be um, substantial consequences from all of it. And I'm also curious about um, what like this week's problems have and how that's going to play out as like as right now, I know in my the, the town that I go to school in, um, there are riots and it's just a lot to be going through right now. Um, wow. And you are a junior, right? So you're about yes. 17 years old? Yes. And you are also in Pennsylvania, but you're in a smaller area? Yes, I will. As of, I'm in the Scranton area right now. Okay. Very good. Um, so I, I'm just going to ask this sort of obvious, quippy question. Um, Susan. Yeah. Take the academic stuff out. You know, yeah. it's two days or three days. What have you been curious about? And you're not allowed to answer virus either. Like, not, you got to give me something else that has something else to do with your life. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to follow that suggestion, because I think one of the things about people who are really curious is that they respond to the environment around them. Um, and I think of my I, you know, you could be an academic and not be very curious. So I, I want to make that distinction. I think I am a curious person, even though I'm an academic. Um, so and uh, about, right. Uh, yeah, and so I'm curious about a, a version of what you started the program with, which is I'm, I'm curious about, very personally, about what makes white people resist uh, the prospect of transcending their racism. Why it's so hard to be a white anti-racist, to be honest. I mean, I can't, I know this is not a political program, but there's no way of talking about curiosity without talking about specifics. So each person here, if they were being really honest, would tell the really specific thing they're curious about. Um, whether it's, you know, if you're a kid and you want to know what secret thing your friend is doing or something about your parents, or um, if it's about some political event or some thing that's happening, as you said, Howard, could be something in your everyday life. I mean, to be honest, we have chickens and we have uh, predators, birds who are flying down and killing the chickens. So my husband and I rigged up uh, a way to, we pulled string, brightly colored string all across the chicken pen yesterday to keep um, the predators out. And for 20 minutes, I was really curious about how to make that rig, like how to set that up. Uh, and what would keep the predators out. But honestly, most of this week that my curiosity is focused on um, not 
what creates racism, because I think I know, but what prevents people from go from leaving it behind? Uh, Young, have, you know, I'm coming to you for the same question. Well, I mean, for me, I'm actually curious about uh, um, how do we get uh, the ideas about uh, reason out there? I, I think right now I'm, I've been, you know, as an educator, I'm, a, I'm not a psychologist, I'm a more of an educator to say, what can we do to get the most basic version of truth to people? Mm. And uh, so I'm just curious about how to do that. And I, I, I'm practicing, I'm trying to write a new book. I'm trying to work on that. And it's, uh, it's been struggling. Uh, and because I see that, uh, you know, I try to watch as many TV channels as possible. I think one thing that education has failed is to help people to come to a good understanding of the most basic things, you know. And because, you know, you look at uh, now the, the split across different uh, political camps is quite large and it's global. So that something has to be done about that. And that actually has been the cause of human tragedies. It's, uh, so I think education needs to get back to that moment about constructing at least the basic human understanding of basic truth. I'm not looking for something big. I'm just some basic, you know, argument. So, so can so, I yeah. jump in? Um, I totally agree with you to a point, totally agree. So before this last week, the thing that was on my mind was why it was so hard for people to understand that wearing a mask protects other people, not yourself, and how it depends on everyone doing it for us all to benefit from it. Um, and it, it has to do with people's difficulty understanding a basic piece of information. Let's not even say fact or truth, because we might learn something new in a year that changes our, our view of that scientifically. But say for now, that's what we think is the best truth available. Why is it so hard for people to understand that? The only thing I would say when we think about schools and about this program is that I don't think people have ever been good at that. I don't think we have to get back to something. I think we have to get to something we've never been, we've right. never had before, which Thank is you. a large number of people being eager to and able to grasp information and use it. So thank you for the setup, because that's yeah. exactly where, <laughs> where I was going to go. I appreciate that. So to Julian, um, do you think that you learn anything if the teacher wants you to learn it if you're not curious about it yourself? In other words, do you have to begin with curiosity? Mm. Well, hmm. that's kind of hard to explain in my case. I think it's hard to explain in everybody's case. Let, yeah, let me ask the question so, in a different. Let me ask the question in a different way. Do you think that humans are better at learning on their own because they're curious about something, or because they're in a room with thirty people and the teacher has a list of things you need to know? Which sounds to you like a better way to learn? Um. In my opinion, I think it's better to learn with more people because then because then you can um, gain information and you can mm -hmm. learn from what other people have done and then take that information and use it um, to achieve what your answer might be. Junior, how old are you? 10. Okay, okay. okay. You've been to school for a few years, right? Yeah. Okay, good, yeah. Go ahead, Howard, I, I'll no, just- Yeah, no, it's, it's the right question. So, um, it seems to me, and maybe I'm completely off base, that if I'm curious about something, that's the place that I begin my learning. The fact that a teacher has a list of things that I need to know, I don't really care. I wanna care, I wanna get good grades so I can succeed and all that, but really, I'm more interested in why is that turtle who's over there, who I know we're not talking about, but it's in the tank with the other turtle, what are they doing and why is it the turtle is trying to get out of the, so, I'm completely over there at that moment in time. If the teacher is talking about like the history of Africa, I'm really interested in the history of Africa. I'm just not interested in the history of Africa right now because the turtles are over there. So does that mean that I'm distractible or does that mean that you ought to be teaching me about turtles at that moment? Julian? Um, for that, in my opinion, I think I would say you first learn the things that you need to know, like 
um, like basic math, writing, and reading. And then you can use that to learn other things. Like if you wanted to learn about that turtle, you can, you can use the things that you've learned to help you learn about it. You seem bright. You seem well-educated for somebody who's 10 years old. Do you have the basics? Can you move on now? Cause like you did it. Okay, good. I'm done. I know everything I need there. I'm now going to learn what I need to learn from there on it from now on. Or do you want to sit through another four years of, of being taught? I'm not necessarily being critical. I'm just being curious. Curiosity. A lot of dead cats around. Ella, what do you think? Um, about what? <laughs> about which question? Um, is it curiosity, your personal curiosity, that leads you into and through learning in an effective way? Or is it the curriculum and your desire to be a functional member of society by following the rules and, and following the discipline, regardless of the fact that you're more interested in the turtles by the window? I think um, curiosity plays a bigger role in learning. Um, like, for example, I am a music student, so I will be more interested in playing trumpet than I will be in learning my English work. So I'll do my English work and entirely forget it the next day, but I can learn an entire song at, on the same day and remember it the next. Do you think it's necessary for you to learn the same thing as Julian? Um, Overall, same curriculum. I think, personally, I think um, it should be geared to towards other people's interests and what you should what you plan on to be doing in your life so i mean i don't think i really need super high math um classes but julian might when he's in 12th grade <laughs> julian i'm going to reverse the question to you do you think it's necessary or a good idea for you to learn what ella learns are you planning to be a music teacher uh i'm actually not planning to be a music teacher but if you wanted to study to become a music teacher, then yeah, then the answer may be yes. It all just depends on what you're curious about and what do you want to learn from it. All students who want to become music teachers should learn the same curriculum or should they follow their own curiosity? There are a lot of kinds of music in the world. So let's use, for example, there is Chinese classical music that's dramatically different from German classical music. So, if I want to be a music teacher, am I only learning the German classical music or does my curiosity take me there to over to Chinese? And by the way, if I'm interested in that, what about Indonesian? Well, as you've been saying, it all depends on where the curiosity takes you. If you wanted to learn classical music, then learn classical music. Um, you just have to know, like I said um, earlier, the basics. You just have to know how you can learn this and then why do you want to. But, but Junior, uh, if you haven't uh, uh, had a chance to know there is classic music, how do you know you're, you'll be interested in classic music? This is a hard one, right? Agreed. <laughs> You're going to have to go in like 42 seconds or something. So I want you to solve the mysteries of curiosity and learning in the next 30 seconds. Go. <laughs> <laughs> what are you thinking? Hmm. In my opinion, what I think is that you, you take the path that you're driven to if if you can learn from it, and then you can actually use it to your advantage. Basic, uh, in a basic version of it, if you wanted to learn how to, how to do a certain type of music, you have to learn, you have to learn all the way about it. But how, how do you get driven to do it is if you're, is if like you want to learn about it and you really do, and it's just, you just want to, or you maybe learn it by surprise that you actually are really good at it. You may not know. You just have to find out by trying. Is that something you would do at school or is that something you would do on your own? Um, in my opinion, um, it would all depend on what you're doing. Because if you wanted to st study this on your own, 
well then, and then if it's working, do the thing that's working, study it on your own. But if you like having a teacher to support you, then use a teacher. It's all, it's all of what you think. You're in control of it is what you're saying. All right. Yes. I don't want to make you late for your other class. Thank you. We're going to take a break. We will be back. so interesting about all of this is when I reflect, and I'm hoping you guys will reflect too, on what I was like as a high school student and before, there would be areas that would capture my imagination. And you write about this a lot in the, in the book, Susan. Um, and I would go deep into those, but I wouldn't necessarily go deep into this subject or that subject, this curiosity, rocks and minerals, fascinated in fourth grade about rocks and minerals. But I didn't go deep into it until I was 40. I spent some time, I learned a little bit, and then 25 years went by, 30 years went by, 40 years went by. So I'm finding as time passes that I revisit things that I was interested in or never had the time to, or I was always a little curious about it, didn't have the tool to pursue it, or I didn't have the money to pursue it, or I wasn't able to travel to the place I wanted to, or whatever it is. and over the course of a lifetime, you sort of don't stop being curious, but, and you also never stop that individualized learning plan for yourself that you sort of have in the back of your head. Uh, in college, I was not the ideal, easy student for the administration to manage, let me say it that way. Mm -hmm. um, because I couldn't imagine why I would wanna sit in a room with 30 other people who knew less than I did or the same as I did and listen to one person tell us things it just that the model made no sense to me um so as a result i don't think a lot of learning went on but the seeds were planted and those seeds and and, and truthfully my wife's interests led me down a path of learning a tremendous amount about american history and then world history and then race and just these books just grow around me now did that get seeded by school or is that my personal curiosity, or am I just strange? Well, Susan. they're not mutually exclusive, the answers, those options you gave out at the end. But I, I want to say two different things. One is I just want to sort of um, pick up on something that both Ella and um, Julian? Yes. Yes, Ella and Julian said, which is, I, I would say that it's very important that people are encouraged to and learn how to pursue things that they're curious about that aren't part of their planned, you know, vocation or their big grand purpose in life. Um, that the most enriched people have all kinds of things they're curious about. And some are fleeting, like my curiosity in protecting my chickens, and some are profound and last forever. And you don't know how something's gonna feed your life later on, which pursuits are going to come back and you're gonna dive into them again or whether they're gonna inform some new thing you're curious about. So I just would hate to see any kind of educational setting. I don't know what you think about this young, but where children are only pursuing the things that they currently think are going to lead to a profession. I, I really actually really object to that view. What? And just quickly, I'm just gonna say one more thing before I, cause I'll forget otherwise, um, which is, I think so far we've left out of this, we've made it like you're either pursuing the things you're curious about or you're doing something some boring teacher is making you do. But that leaves out the whole world of great teachers of which there are many who make something interesting to you that you didn't know you'd be interested in. Yeah. Um, that isn't part of what you already were interested in, but they show you what's intriguing or mysterious or unexpected about it. So there's a, there's, let's not leave out that, 
crucial middle part, which is probably the most important part for education. So Ella, you're in the middle of this. Um, the music education idea, did that come from just watching somebody else do it? Did that become your own curiosity? How did you go down that path? Or, or what led you to that path? Um, I've always wanted to pursue music. Um, and I've also been to, I've been to like different um, camps um, where I would go to different colleges and I'd be with professors and I, and I've always just wanted to make a difference to other kids that could be taught well. And um, like in my school, I know that like some people have different levels of music music education behind them, like when they're coming into high school. So I just, I would like to make sure that at least one school, everyone has the same amount of the, of music ability. Young, how do you map school, which is, which has to be institutionalized, right? And it's a model that we use around the world, onto the idea that each of us is a unique person with the, now the ability to be able to learn a great deal on our, on our own. Well, I was very fascinated by, honestly, your, your, your recounting of your history, you know, in a sense that, you know, Howard, you were talking about, you know, going down with your wife, learning all these different things. And I think, you know, uh, I'm not a big uh, kind of supporter of schools necessarily. I, I think uh, what we should be talking about is education. I mean, schools were built uh, um, 100, 200 years ago uh, during that time when, well, everything we had was so different from today, but we've been carrying on with that. So, so I said, Ella and Julian, I mean, I see a lot of the, our today's children being placed into schools, being given the same things, being placed based on biological aid, which is, again, a strange thing anyway. If you start in September, start in November, December, there's always a year, you know, do you see that, that, that a huge difference? I think, uh, you know, today, I think uh, the, uh, a big thing we need to think about, really two things. One is the, what does the individual have? Individuals are different and so different that they can be, you know, polarized, but at the same time, individuals have something in common. That's what makes us human beings. So, so that's really the first piece, how do we deal with that? The second piece I want to just throw in here is culture. Schools, not all schools are there to liberate people. A lot of schools are designed to make you similar. Actually, a lot of schools in many different cultures, different countries, they design is produce identical machines. So schools try very hard to prescribe a curriculum and make sure you follow the curriculum, then you become the same. And out of those, there's still opportunities for curiosity, for thinking, but it's massively drastically reduced. I think that's why we need to think about schools. You know, I love the topic of picking, like curiosity, creativity, you know, thinking is, but what's interesting is that when we think about reinventing schools, I love the topic, reinventing. How do you reinvent a school? I think the first thing we need to reinvent is really the so-called curriculum. What are students going to learn? What do you expect them to come? And how are we going to do that becomes secondary. I think right now with COVID-19, I don't think there's much discussion really about the what. You know, was to keep talking about we're going to do the same thing, you know. So that's where I think the power of that is to do with the curiosity, creativity, individual differences. How do you emphasize that piece? And what experiences lead you to those places? So for me, we were, we were coming up on a, on a major high school reunion. And of course, that's canceled now. It's supposed to be in the next few weeks. So it'll be next year, whatever. Um, and we had to answer the question, what was it about high school that you found most memorable? And for me, it was doing a high school musical. It was the first time that I, and my father was, it was for a very long time in the television production business doing big shows. For me to walk in and be a part of something like that and understand that people had to learn their lines, that they had to block the show, that actors and actresses had to show up on time, that it had to completely dominate your life, that excuses were not acceptable because if you weren't there, they could not rehearse. Watching it come together, having an audience come in and applaud the work we'd done, it set me up for a career. Had I not walked into that room at that time, 
because a friend invited me in for whatever reason for an audition. Um, mainly, I think, because I was a boy and I don't think they had enough boys. I think it was like a criteria like that. Um, those experiences are for me what school is for. The idea of sitting in classroom after classroom all through the day, learning things that mostly I don't care about, when I've got the internet and all these other tools, and by the way, a whole lot of books and a whole lot of experiences in life that I can pursue because we're able to do that, school becomes a different thing for me. School becomes a place where you can do plays. And that's perfectly okay. I, I mean, I built a career doing things that I learned that started at that moment. Ella and then Susan. Ella, you look like you're bursting to say something. Oh, no, I'm, I don't have anything to say. All right, then I read that wrong. So, <laughs> Susan. Well, I just want to um, suggest that we make a distinction. Both might are really important, but they're not quite the same. A distinction between doing things you really care about, which I think school should be. And I think there's a real reason for that, um, which is that in order to be invested in things as an adult, if you want to talk about future goals or goals of education, you have to have the chance to do that in school. And we do an amazing job of preventing students from getting deeply engaged in things they care a lot about. I too loved theater when I was a young kid. In fact, my first experience as a teacher was running a theater program for young children when I was a teenager. So um, you could love something and really throw yourself into it. And I think school should give students that experience so that they can get better at that, at being deeply engaged, at working themselves, you know, silly to uh, thinking about something nonstop. But I don't think it's exactly the same as being curious. And I think developing the capacity to identify something that surprises you and then figure out what you need to do to to resolve that surprise or to answer your curiosity. I think that's a really particular intellectual skill. And, you know, since you've so graciously said you've read my book, you know that I think that the research suggests that we all start with a great voracious appetite for um, answering questions or solving mysteries, but it wanes over time, especially in settings, schools, home life that discourages it. So learn, school has a huge, teachers have a huge role to play in supporting curiosity and teaching kids how to pursue their curiosity. But I don't think it's exactly the same as engagement. And the reason I say that is one of the wrong messages that I think schools get is that as long as kids are doing projects, whatever people mean by projects, uh, then they're solving all these different educational problems. And that's just throwing everything into the same basket. And it, it's kind of a waste. Ella, if you could design your school week, not day, but week, what would the biggest chunks be? Um, it would probably be music. <laughs> um, yes, I, I would definitely Play. have. What, what? When you say music's a little broad, what would you be doing? Um, I'd probably have a music theory class, a music theory class, um, piano, band, chorus, maybe theater. Like if I could put all of that into my schedule, I would. And what would you give up? What would you drop? Right um, now? Math and science, because <laughs> I don't think I need it that much. Okay, so you're based on that, Ella, that um, need. You may mm -hmm. not need it. Uh, how do you respond to people who prescribe those uh, uh, subjects for you to say, well, you will need them in the future? What, what do you think? Personally, I think, um, I think that schools are, have that prescribed curriculum. And I don't think it's fair to some people that are, um, that are like poor at doing math. And then, but then they're also judged at the same level that someone is curious, more curious about math than one person is. Um, but for myself, I kind of think, I don't think like that I'm going to need, um, how to do trigonometry for being a music educator in four years. <laughs> well, that's fair. So it's actually a question for all of us to think about is, uh, you know, I think, uh, um, Susan, you, you might agree with this, is that we, are, we all have the capacity to be curious when we are born, which is, I think, is necessary for us to survive. Honestly, there's some uh, 
evolutionary reasons for us to have that, then whatever we can be curious about gets both narrowed and expanded. So that that's an, it depends on how we, how we deal with things. So I was actually curious to say, okay, so uh, Ella, you know, I'm, I'm going to use you as an example. I loved your students as an example. So if you had been born into a, a culture or a school system where music were not offered, uh, mm -hmm. what would you do? Um, I mean, I don't know if I was, do you mean if I was brought up into or if I you was were brought up in a home, in a family, in a different country where music was simply not offered? You're, it's not allowed. There are mm -hmm. cultures. It's not, what would you do? I think I would try to find other people that have the same views as I did, as I do, and then um, try to make like a group and then attempt to make our own group and start. A I was just thinking, would you be brave enough to go against the resources, all those sources? I mean, of, I think I would. Um, I'm a, I pretty much stand out of the crowd as much as I can. If there's something going wrong, I, wrong, I will say something. <laughs> well, that's great. So this is back to Howard. The reason I asked that question, I think it's another big, big uh, uh, question on an individual basis is courage. Is that curiosity and courage? Do you, when you have curiosity, how serious are you? There are some people who cannot be oppressed or suppressed, some people who can't. And then so they can switch and they can tame whatever they have and then go to a different route. It's, it's, it's a very long story, I'm sure. Susan can tell us more about that. Susan, let me sharpen that a bit. So a lot of people have become very interested in the history of contemporary civil rights and some of the uh, some of the issues that surround that, whether it's law enforcement or how we make laws or why we have the history we do. So let's imagine a few students who go, who come to the principal, as I would have done, and say, I think it's more important for me to know that right now than anything else you're teaching. So I'd like to blow up my curriculum, so would my friends here, and we'd like to start something new. I'd like, for the next year, I wanna do nothing but study this. I wanna to go to places, I wanna to talk to people. I want to, I've never understood the difference between a symposium and a colloquia, but we'll have a <laughs> symposia, whatever. Uh, and just really concentrate, rather than being interrupted by tests or whatever, I really wanna know this and I'm in a university environment or I'm in a high school environment, this is what I wanna do. How do we make that possible or is that a bad idea or somewhere in between? Um, well, so just to go back to um, the earlier comment, I do, I agree. Some people are so tenacious in their curiosity, both tenacious and brave, courageous. Uh, that they pursue the thing they want to no matter what. Uh, my eldest son was a sophomore the year that um, uh, Massachusetts had started these um, statewide mandatory tests and he boycotted them. And it meant he might have failed and not graduated, but he felt so strong. I mean, you know, so he had a strong urge and was courageous about not doing what he was supposed to in order to do what he wanted to in order to pursue his curiosity. Um, but we don't, to, to Howard's point, we wouldn't want to just depend on the few people who are happy to be lucky enough, or like Ella, who would pursue her love of music no matter what, that nothing could get in your way. But we would, wouldn't it be better if we helped lots and lots of kids, even the ones who weren't so courageous or didn't have such an intense sort of specific focus uh, to pursue their curiosity? And that starts in early childhood. So I don't know who listens to the show or watches it, but for all the people who work with very young children um, and all the parents who, who listen to your show, uh, developing a kid's capacity to pursue what interests them even in the face of discouragement or setback um, or competing demands, that starts in early childhood. You can't wait till you're in high school uh, to, to become that person. And, you know, lots of people could, even if they're not going to be Greta Thunberg, they're going to, they could pursue what interests them and matters to them if they were helped, if they were educated towards that when they're young. And that takes a very deliberate kind of education. That's not just about 
getting out of their way or not being too strict. That's about focusing on something totally different than most of our schools focus on. It also requires the proper time and the proper environment. And I want to talk about that when we come back right after this break. From Makita uh, in our chat, um, racial literacy needs to start earlier, and adults need re-education surrounding race and the and this country's founding history. I'll expand that to many countries' founding history, not just the United States. Um, so part of this is how do you do the kind of learning that we want that seems to begin with an individual's curiosity, but then greatly expands all the way over to the school has decided what you should be curious about. And we have a pretty wide, very messy, sloppy spectrum. Um, but that relies upon having teachers who actually know how to answer those questions and set up the situation in which the kid can learn. Um, so last week we had uh, a student on Maya, I think her name was, uh, and she wanted, she's interested in putting together a uh, financial literacy education in Liberia and Guinea. And she asked her teacher to, to help her think in that direction. And I'm thinking the likelihood that the teacher, Mawa, her name, um, uh, the likelihood that the teacher actually knew much about Guinea in Africa was probably fairly small. So we can't really expect the teachers would know everything about everything, but in an environment where you can be interested in so many things and school ought to support that, where do you find these super teachers who are several steps away in every subject area? It, it, you'd have to create these sort of super curious, super curiosity robots or something like that. That was a bad example, but um, is, Young, you want to invent that for us? Yeah, well, I'm actually, uh, you should invite me in three months later. I'm trying to finish my book. It's called Learners Without Borders. You know, Learners Without Borders. I think we have been talking a lot about, for a long time, how to improve schools. But students have been confined by the borders. The main, you mentioned the one, just teachers have become a border sometimes because a teacher may or may not know everything. And actually, it's a problem. The same thing with you know, curriculum is a border, a pathway is a border, you know, so this, so what I think in, in the case, I was just going to try to bring the point and Howard, you're so great, you brought it up here is that I don't think we can rely on teachers on everything. I, I'm really believing in this kind, you know, this massive or mass peer tutoring systems. I, I really believe to this youth, let's say Ella or Julian, if you were interested in finding something or somebody, you actually can do so online. If you, you can find some, it may take you some courage, it may take you a little bit, you know, if you want to reach, so let's say Howard, you might take you a few days to reach there, but you can actually find someone and someone to teach you that. I think that we need to stay away or try to get away from the idea that the teacher dictating what students can learn or what students' curiosity can be. I think that's the border we need to break. We cannot always live within that borders. You know, online learning, online materials. I don't know how many people tried in recently. If you get online, if you want to know something, typically you can find it. And if you want to know more, you can actually find someone to tell you more. And that's just one thing that's quite interesting. It won't be the same in depth, but you won't get started. You can find a place to go. And if you're serious, people will actually become mentors, tutors. It's, it's a fascinating process. So I think we need to acknowledge that the technology today 
has made it so that we can learn from, with, and learn for somebody anywhere on, on the globe. I think that's possible. And music is a great example of that, where before your exposure to different kinds of music, different instruments, different ways of thinking about music, different music history, all of that, different instruments, very difficult. Now, if you need to find a euphonium player, you're going to find the euphonium player, even though most people wouldn't have any idea what a euphonium is. But we've opened the world. We've given people these devices. But with that, we've also given everybody permission and confidence to find that information. So it's not just the computer. It's the willingness to engage so that if you're curious about, well, what, so you're like eight years old, but you're thinking about your gender identity? And then you can have a serious discussion about that. Yeah, well, I saw this YouTube on the YouTube video online when I was five. Okay. And you had that discussion with your parents. Oh, yeah. And with my aunts and uncles and all. So everything has changed so dramatically that you can pursue these curiosities to a greater or lesser extent. The trick is how do you design schools around that so that that environment which has to be social and has to be local and, and is extraordinarily useful, can keep up. Susan, how do we do this? Well, I just want to put the teacher back in the story here um, because we all know probably everybody on this meeting, symposium, whatever it is, um, <laughs> knows people who gather tons of information online and it's unreliable information or they put it together in a way that's incoherent or doesn't make sense or they only look for information that supports a view they already had so for instance one of the things i think ella that you learn in college or maybe in high school maybe in your high school but you definitely learn it i hope at, at some colleges is to ask yourself all the time what if i'm wrong so first you think i want to know about whatever it is um, the history of race relations in this country. And you have an idea of what the history is or what the, some, th some thought about it. And then you look for information and the mark of a really educated person is the capacity to say, what if I find out that the thinking I've had so far has been wrong? You could say that about masks. I've been thinking as you've been talking about debates on vaccination in this country, people all think they can get information online to support their point of view. And that doesn't make them educated and it isn't a very good use of, cur of what might pose as curiosity. It's really searching for information to support what you already think. So I would say, it's a long-winded answer, I'm sorry, Howard, but we desperately need teachers to guide that process um, because the curiosity of the infant is not the curiosity we want in the 18-year-old. And that's where education comes in, to take that initial appetite for information and help guide it towards a, a thoughtful, responsible, um, um, discerning use of information as you get older. Uh, so I, I think teachers are essential in that. I need to jump in here uh, before you, you come in. I think Susan, the, uh, the point was uh, I was trying to make about teachers is that uh, uh, teachers can be at a distance. I just want to add anybody who can guide you, have that wisdom to support you, to guide you, can be a teacher. And also I think we're talking about different student populations, like younger children, old kids, and adults uh, in different ways. So I just want to add that. And the teacher may not be with you in real time. Uh, so last night I was curious uh, about why the red in my watercolor kit wasn't working the way it ought to. And I learned in an 18 minute video from a watercolorist in Australia, the answer to my question. After looking at any endless things that were just simply wrong, but I found somebody who had the right answer. That's the clarification. Oh, Howard, how did you know it was the right answer? How did you know the other answers were the wrong answer? Because I had a watercolor paints in, in front of me. And every time I painted it, I'm like, but that's not what it's supposed to look like. It's too orange, right? right? Okay. So I kept going, why is it so orange if it says red on the label? This doesn't make sense. So, and I kept looking at the pigment information. I've gone deep in this because I'm very curious about it. I'm just as you're learning, Ella, you're learning music theory. I'm learning color theory. And I'm doing it as meticulously as I can 
and I'm finding things out that I've been curious about since high school, but just never did it. So now I'm spending 20 minutes a night and I'm doing it. Why? Because we're all stuck in a house forever. So this is my, this is the thing I'm doing instead of playing with chickens. Um, so, <laughs> so Ella, if, if your current path was closed to you, what else are you curious about? Um, I'm not even sure. <laughs> I mean, I'm curious about, um, I really like lang different languages. I'm curious about, um, art. I'm curious about other people's religions, um, and just like other people's cultures as well. Do you listen to music from around the world? Yes. How? Um, I will, what I'll do, I'm, I'm a classical voice, um, most of, like, most of the part, so I'll try to listen to any kind of classical music I can. Um, I will also listen to, like, anything I can really get my hands on, so I'll put, like, Spotify on, and I'll, like, just search through, like, different genres and different medias and, like, see what I can get. Have you listened to polyphonic Tuvan throat singers? Yes. <laughs> they have. <laughs> How? All right, that's a great, thank you for walking right into that. Um, so <laughs> how do you, how is it possible that you and I know about this? And I'm just going to just, young Susan, do you guys know about this? About what? Tuvan throat singers, polyphonic sing. Okay, good. I don't know. Right. I have so no you idea. and I both landed on this strange part of the planet, right? How did you learn about this? Why do you know about this? Um, I went to a, um, I went to a festival and I saw someone do it. I heard someone doing it inside, inside of a song. And so I looked up what it was called. And then, um, and then that just led me to all of it. And do you, they do it? Can you explain what it is? And, and is it the only, the only place that it happens in the world is Mongolia or does it happen elsewhere? Um, I, I think it happens like in a lot of different places. Um, I think it's mostly in Mongolia. Um, and it's more of like a, I don't, it's, <laughs> it's, I think, um, usually it's like cir circular breathing. So, um, you have to like inhale through your mouth and then exhale through your nose while you're doing it. And then it's also like a humming sort of weird throat singing thing. I don't know how to do it and I don't really understand it completely. <laughs> but there is a tradition in Sicily mm -hmm. with groups of four men. There's a tradition, I believe in Appalachia. I mean, it's just, it's sort of amazing how this one small curiosity. The reason I mention that is if the music teaching path was unavailable for whatever reasons, you're interested mm -hmm. in world cultures, you're interested in how people live, you're inter all those interests all weave together somehow in very uneven, mm -hmm. very unpredictable ways. And then you'll meet somebody, mm -hmm. you'll see something, you'll taste something, and then a whole new path emerges. So, and this is the way we all learn. This for me has been the joy of traveling around the world, interviewing mm -hmm. kids and doing all sorts of other things. And I'm, I'm watching Young and, and Susan who are going, yeah, that's, I mean, we don't, learn in a linear way. We certainly don't learn in a curriculum oriented way. And yet we have this system that seems to discourage individual learning exactly what you and I are talking about. So is, does this become the responsibility of the individual student? Does everybody have to put this together the way Ella or, or Julian was putting it together? And school becomes a tool, which is sort of where Julian was going earlier. Or do we just sort of accept it for what it is and go, well, yeah, I mean, we'll play some, some football in, in high school and we'll also learn on our own. I'm feeling during this era that learning on our own and having every student and every parent taking charge might be the only solution because I don't think schools are going to function the way they did. Well, yeah. I mean, maybe actually uh, through another um, thing here toward the end, uh, it is that, uh, yes, we're curious, we can learn something, and uh, we also have to make a living. 
we have to we have to make a living. Where someone has to pay us for doing whatever we are curious about. So that's the major curiosity. Let's say you do. Oh, you can of course you can go. Let's say work in a restaurant, and still do your music, or you can do music and be big. So and there are different ways to deal with that. I think uh, uh, in education we need to figure out help our children figure out another way to say okay. Yes, I have this huge curiosity about this body of things. I want to discover more, I want to reinvent new technology. You can do whatever you like. But how is that going to contribute to other people? So that's actually what I am really curious about is, okay, how can schools do that? And by the way, I already agree with you. I think right now, I don't expect schools to have massive changes. However, I do hope through Ella and others, we can recreate different educational institutions in the new age. Susan? I'm not even sure what question I'm asking you at this point. I paused because unexpectedly someone was talking in the background, sorry. Yeah, ask me a question. Yeah, so, <laughs> What I want to see, and maybe this is my fantasy, is having students driven by their own curiosities with, as Julian said, a level of practical education so that I've got competence, right? At a certain point, I've got enough competence, sufficient competence in enough different areas. But as a student, I want to be able to raise my hand and say, I'm really curious how it is that we still have race problems and we don't seem to solve them despite Parkland, despite all of the other things that have happened, somehow things remain the same more than they change. How can I be involved so that we can end up in a better place? Greta Thunberg would be a great example with climate change. How do we make things better by improving ourselves? And how do I get my school to do that on a massive, in a massive way, not in a I had a really good conversation and we're going to have a few meetings or we're going to have an assembly. But I want to see real change. I think that, it, that we're in an era now where that's very necessary. Certainly having all of these people die because we didn't prepare for a public health crisis is inexcusable. The idea that we don't have a public health curriculum in every school, in every grade is insanity to me. But I think the same is true for for international relations and understanding cultures. I don't well, understand why we're not doing this. But, so, but Howard, how that's do I get my of... curiosity and, bl and make that into something more if I'm Ella's age or if I'm my age or your age? Okay, but that's a contradiction because you're suggesting curricula uh, that you think are important in schools, but we people have been saying, I'm not sure I'm one of them, but some of you have been saying all along that you think that imposing curriculum on kids is a mistake because you need to start with what they're interested in. So just setting that aside, I would say that part of this has to do with the general theme that we could probably agree on is that kids need to have more control over their learning experiences and certainly at a much earlier age than we think they can. And that's not all about individual learning. They can take control over their learning collectively. And we have examples of that um, uh, all, all over the country and all over the world of students making having more of a role to play in determining the course of their education because one might hope and pray that young people today are going to collectively decide there are other things they must and want to learn about in school um, and that all the terrible things that are happening right now and have a history aren't new they've been happening uh, that they want to make a difference and uh, they're going to take charge of that um, so i'll end on that <laughs> um, ella Yes. What do you make of all this? Do you want, um, how much control do you want over your own education and what goes into your head? I think um, that it's, I think it's good to start at a base level of education um, from like until a certain age. And then I think you should, then I think students should have their own, um, they should have control over what they'd be learning. Um, because or like just having that base level of math english history um just to be able to be successful in life and young what's successful in life 
you can tie all this together. You have the last piece. I, I, to end of everything, I think this is a topic that we can have for a whole year to discuss. You know, I think there's a lot of this we didn't discuss. I also don't think there is really a success in life. I think every day is a success. It has to be a success to carry on. I don't think you go achieve success. And really most important, I think whoever is listening uh, on this show, it's very important. I think I agree with Susan that parents are very important. By the time children go to school, that's already too late. Honestly, you know, too many things to get started. I think we have to change our family, our, our community, and re help our children rethink about this. It's, uh, and by the way, I, I came from a very poor family. I don't think any poverty is a reason to deprive children of the opportunity to have access to pilot their uh, curiosity. On that note, um, <laughs> we're gonna wrap things up. Typically, some of us hang out afterwards for a few minutes. So, um, you know, we welcome our guests to do that as well. Uh, but uh, thank you all very much for joining us. Next week, we're gonna look at how media and the stories it tells, often with big budgets, uh, become a very effective means of teaching us, for example, about the Civil War or the Vietnam War, perhaps in a way that is well beyond the ability for teachers to do the same. Thank you all very much. Have a safe and good week. Think good thoughts, um, and, uh, and we'll see you soon. demand episodes, and more, visit our website. Kids on Earth contains hundreds of video interviews with students from around the world. Learning Revolution is a global collaboration network for people who care about learning. Be sure to join us next Thursday for a new episode of Reinventing School. Thanks for watching.